Okay, we're all set. Go right ahead. Thank you. You're good to go. All right, wonderful. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen with you guys and and um, get the presentation up for you. Uh, okay. I hope you guys have been doing well. Um, my hair is growing longer by the day, uncontrollably. And I've yet not decided to um, go out on my own to try to cut it. So um, hopefully salons or barbershops or whatever can open up soon. Probably not. Anyways, uh, I'm glad to be with all of you again. And thanks for taking the time out to uh, talk about ankle stability and specifically as it relates for landings or how um, we can implement things to not only strengthen and improve ankle range of motion and stability, but have it translate into improvements in landings. Um, landings are, an, uh, are a critical part of the sport from a performance side of things because you, it could be a difference from being on the podium or not on the podium. Um, you can have anywhere from a full mark deduction to anywhere you know, from a mark down to about zero deduction from your landing. So it's a critical part of the sport. However, it also contributes to a catastrophic um, aspect of the sport. Um, there's 36% 30, of all injuries sustained within gymnasts. And there's not a lot of research uh, with, to do with gymnastics. And that's something we're trying to improve on an international level. But the, the research that is out there, 36% of all injuries are occurred during dismounts essentially during landings. And its highest uh, uh, rate of injuries is within girl sports, um, more so than male sports. And when you examine, uh, I thought this would be interesting for you to know, and this is something you probably all know anyways, gymnastics is second to only football in terms of frequency of injuries that athletes uh, get. So if you're dealing with a large volume of injuries to begin with, and such a high percentage of are, are due to landings, um, it could have huge implications, obviously, on the health of an athlete, but also on the performance side of, of, of the athlete. And, and the injuries predominantly when you land make sense that it would be in the lower extremity, but you, you even get to start to have some effects up into your low back. And the reasoning being is that this, our bodies are one big sort of um, uh, connection from feet to head. Actually, I have an interesting model that maybe I'll go and fetch in a moment to show you um, visually what it's like in our body. So if, if we have poor landing strategies or poor ankle range of motion or stability, um, when we land, it's going to affect things up the chain. So it's not just knee, ankle, hip related stuff that would um, present with injuries, but uh, it can translate up to, into your low back. So I want to talk to you about some a phenomenon that takes place within our bodies or just in movement when we're having to deal with walking around or performing things in a world where we have to deal with gravity. And that is reaction forces. So for every action that we generate with our body, there's the equal and opposite reaction based on Newton's third law that we, all, we have to then re deal with. And that's the reaction forces. So it's very easily demonstrated in this one picture here with someone stepping off a boat, their action is generating propulsion to move themselves forward. And you can see the reaction forces because the boat being in a less frictional environment can just glide backwards. You see that reaction force. However, when we're walking on solid surfaces, we, we can't see these reaction force, uh, forces as, as much. So every step that you take onto the ground, whether it's as simple as walking or sprinting, or in this case, landing, you're exerting a certain degree of force into the ground. And that force in the case of landing can be sometimes nine times your body weight. Meaning if you weigh hundred pounds, there's 900 pounds of force that are then being asked to, to being generated into the ground and then asked to being reabsorbed by the body. So if anywhere along the kinetic chain, we've lost capacity to absorb these reaction forces, it's gonna wreak havoc. It's gonna wreak havoc on connective tissue and causing tears. It's gonna cause havoc on joint tissue and causing irritation within the joint um, that can cause fractures, worst case scenario. And up the chain, it can affect the knee, it can affect the hip, 
Um, interestingly enough, for you to know, the ACL tears in a very small degree of motion, predominantly. And that is in the first 20 or 30 degrees of bending in the knee. Well, guess what happens when you land? For the most part, especially in the sport of gymnastics, you're required to mostly land within a 20 to 3 degree range, 20 to 30 degree range. And on top of that, if you've lost capacity in and around the foot and ankle to some degree, the chain effect is it's going to load in the knee joint that much more. So that when you do land in this vulnerable range of motion for the ACL, if you're not absorbing these forces as well through your foot and ankle, it's going to lead to more forces going on through your knee and eventually contributing to potential tears. The other thing that's quite uh, remarkable that I'm always astounded by athletes in the sport of gymnastics is these nine times, uh, nine times your body weight of reaction forces that your body's having to absorb, it's having to do it in, in, in a split second of time. And it's having to do it while you're coming out of a twist or rotation and multiple flips. So it's not like me just jumping off and landing on my two feet, I'm having to twist and reorganize my, my body to be able to reposition it upon landing. So these reaction forces aren't always set up to be absorbed in the most ideal manner in my body, given that I'm coming out of twists and all these things. And this, because of this, it puts that much more emphasis on making sure our foot and ankle stability and range of motion is really good. Um, on a global level, just talking about landings in general, and we're not going to talk about this too much, but I think it's important for you as coaches to recognize. When I was, in, uh, was around the sport of gymnastics, when I first got involved in obviously being at a national level and working with some national level coaches, this picture is what it looks like typically uh, when a gymnast is coached on how to land, this type of body alignment. An ideal body alignment for your body to make sure it's in a position where there's least amount of loading on specific tissues, but good general loading on a lot of tissues is one in where you see those two lines that I've, I've put, I put there from, from the line, sort of the, the ankle to the knee and then the hip to the shoulder. It's one in which those lines are parallel. So if you don't have great lower leg alignment in relationship to the upper body and those lines are not parallel, what that means is there's tissues and there's joints that are being overburdened and over demanded of um, that eventually can contribute to some of the aches and pains that gymnasts get. So the, the first thing is typically in the sport for aesthetic purposes, how we're how the athletes are judged on landings. is not ideal to the, the, the optimal way for the body to move. That's somewhat, I've, I spoke to one judge about this and judges, some judges are not picky and may not deduct. Some judges will be picky and they will deduct. Either way, I want you to know it's not consistent with what is optimal for the body to have this kind of a landing position. The other contributors obviously to, to injuries when you're landing is if there's any poor neuromuscular control and I'll talk about neuromuscular control a little bit. Um, but that is essentially tissues, muscle tissues that are healthy otherwise, but they're just not fully activating uh, for, for one reason or another. So that can contribute to why so the, some of these forces, these reaction forces put on the body are not being absorbed really well and ultimately causing issues uh, at injuries. Um, and then obviously ankle and knee joint. They're the, the primary joints in landing, especially in the sport of gymnastics that are demanded of the most. So strength around these two, two joints and range of motion around these two joints are vital. Just to give you a couple of other demonstrations of what I'm talking about, I actually came across this figure, which was uh, this figure here on the left in a gymnastics book that was teaching that this is a safe landing technique. So if you look at those two lines, they are not parallel at all. So if someone was to actually land in this manner with significant amount of force, like coming out of a flip or a dismount off bars, the loading that will be put on the ankle and the knee joint to do this and on the back is quite significant. And regardless of how healthy and strong the gymnast is, within anywhere between one to 10 landings, they're bound to get some sort of a soft tissue or uh, some irritation or joint trauma the body will never strive to land like this, just instinctively on its own. Um, 
the top right corner is another image I found of what it's considered to be a good landing. Aesthetically, this looks great. And it's simple when we're doing simple skills like a front, like just a tuck jump like this guy's doing. But when, now that we're doing such more complicated skills, this is a lot to ask of athletes to land in this way. The bottom right is, is another image of what, how an athlete would maybe typically coach to land. So these things you may as coaches or me as a therapist may not be able to change from the sport. The fact, the aesthetic requirement of someone landing like that, although it makes no, no, um, it's not ideal or optimal for the body. The more we can coach athletes and maybe suggest alternative ways of landing, the better. But in the meantime, we got to look at, okay, if this is what's required. What do we need from the body? And if we just look at this bottom right image, you can see the amount of ankle range of motion you need. You need a significant degree of ankle range of motion to make sure someone can land in that position and not and be able to at least tolerate some of those forces without breaking down. Um, just before we go back to the ankle, just to mention something else, I came across this lecture that someone put on about what a proper jump squat landing would be look like. This may look appropriate, but this is also not ideal either. As you see, those two lines are not parallel. That's not an ideal landing position. This will be significantly loading on the back. Maybe the ankle, maybe the knee joint is saved a little bit, but now the back is being demanded of. Ideal landing position is you have those two lines parallel. Um, so, you, But you can manipulate things. So the more you can strive to, to coach your athletes to land, with a somewhat um, bent over upper body with a somewhat extended hip, like where the hip being pointing back a little bit, the, the more they're gonna be able to distribute these reaction forces amongst more tissues with less risk of injury. Um, however, our focus here is on the foot and ankle. So let's talk about the foot and ankles. And, and as you notice in this last picture at the bottom right, and even the top left, you can see how much range of motion, how much bending we need at the ankle um, when we want to land. Um, so that's important. If that's what we got to work with, that's what we need to improve. So the first and foremost is we got to make sure that they're at, our gymnasts have optimal ranges of motion at, at their ankle joint. And specifically in gymnastics, they do a lot, we do a lot, there's a lot of work done to improve flexibility in this direction to be able to point your toes, but we got to put equal amount of time and effort to improve range of motion in the opposite direction. Um, and eat females even more so than men because of the, uh, the nature of the landings from the skills that they're coming down from. So this range of motion is that much more vital to be able to have someone be able to flex their ankle um, in the significant range of motion. Um, we call that, that range of motion dorsiflexion. So if I say dorsiflexion, that's what I'm referencing. I hope uh, it's, it's, um, that connects with you. Now, if there is insufficient dorsiflexion, or if there's insufficient of the ankle to bend um, in this way, bending this way, it's not that the body can't find ways to compensate. So if we go back to this image here on this top left corner, that young lady in the black and white that has that, that range of motion, is, doesn't have it in the optimal way that she needs it. And I could just tell from the image because the body is, is what we're really great at is always adapting and compensating. And as you can see in this image, this person lacks the ability to bend at their ankle. So what they do is they collapse their arch. And by collapsing their arch, they can actually rotate their feet. I'm gonna to try to move my hand so you can see it. So if they collapse their arch and rotate their feet so that they can go further forward because in this position, they can't go forward. That's a problem because when we talked about earlier about ACL related injuries, oftentimes it happens, uh, the majority of times it happens within the first 20 or 30 degrees of knee bend. And those first 20 or 30 degrees of knee bend are strongly influenced by what's happening at the foot and ankle when you land. So we need to make sure there's that range of motion in the ankle so we don't have to have the arch collapse. We don't have to have the rot foot rotate because the moment that happens, what's happening in this picture is what you get. You get the whole lower leg and the whole lower limb starts to rotate inwards, causing the knee to collapse inwards. And that's what puts the stress and the strain on the, um, on the actual ligament, your ACL. So off we will try and to educate or, or inform the athletes and coach them to try to land with their knees level. 
But if they don't have the proper strength, the proper range of motion in their foot and ankle, it doesn't matter how much we tell them to try to land with their knees in a, in a stable position, their knees will collapse because of what they're lacking in their foot and ankle. Um, so so th it's important to understand the body will compensate and even the, the fact that it looks like they're getting range of motion in their ankle and may not be purely coming from their ankle. And joints are, these are all the different joints that, we, there are, that are in our foot and ankle and there's tons of them. And in terms of the hierarchy of what's important, our brain puts way more emphasis and importance on the health and the functioning of a joint than it does to any particular muscle. Um, so, and we have direct motor input to, from a joint to muscles. What that means is as the joint is functioning well, the muscles around that joint are gonna function well. If a joint is not functioning well, either because of lack of range of motion or of injury, the muscles around the joint are not gonna function well. So we need to make sure all these joints have really good range of motion, really good coordination amongst them, really good mobility within them. Because all these things contribute to how well the muscles around them function and behave. And this is important because going back to this picture, as gymnasts, they're frequently getting some ankle sprain, some compression related sort of pinching in the front of their ankles from landing short. There's always some trauma happening to the ankle joints. And typically speaking, they either work through it, they tape it up and work through it, or, 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 or some cases they'll actually get therapy to care for it, but most often they'll just work through it. The problem is the body is such that once you have an injury to a joint, there is a change in the behavior of the muscles and the tissues around that joint long after the pain has gone away. So unless that is addressed, that person will have some deficits in their functional ability way after their pain is gone. And that will in the long term start to affect their, their ability to improve range of motion, their ability to have control upon landings. Now what some therapists, what some coaches would do is they'll say, okay, we're going to train that we're going to reestablish that we're going to develop and strengthen that by giving you these proprioceptive type exercises where you're standing on a wobble board and working on balancing and that's good and it's beneficial but when someone lands they're not landing with their ankle in the neutral position when they land their ankle is going to be in all sorts of different degrees of bending so what this exercise lacks is the ability to strengthen and improve proprioception in all the ranges of motion of that ankle joint. We are just working on one specific ankle range of that ankle, which is mostly neutral. And it's a position that a gymnast will hardly ever land in. So my qualms with an exercise like this is it's not accomplishing what we want to accomplish, which is strengthening through different components or different aspects of the range of motion this gymnast will potentially land in. So I'm, this video, I'm going to demonstrate something with you. So this is a former dancer. She had an ankle sprain some 15 years ago when she was dancing. So I do a little bit of test here. And what I do is I test some of the muscles around the ankle joint, their ability to generate force, essentially, to meet my resistance. As, and as you can see, she fails. Um, I don't know how, how well you guys saw that because it's now a little bit, uh, oh, there we go. Now it's smooth. But she failed. So now I've given her a specific exercise to do. And what I'm specifically trying to do is have the muscles activate and be loaded during the entirety of the range of motion of the ankle. So I haven't given her anything to do like standing on a wobble board. I'm just getting her to do some mild activity of the muscles in and around the ankle joint through the full range of motion of the ankle joint to try to stimulate, uh, stimulate a good activity to the joint and improve strength of the joint throughout the entirety of the range of, uh, of motion that that joint has available to it. And in a moment, I'm going to retest it. And you're going to see I'm having to push a lot harder and it's still not budging. So what I showed that to demonstrate, if I had her on a wobble board and had her just stand on a single uh, um, in that single position and I got her on the ground like this and I just pointed her toes a little bit like I just did and did that test, she would not be able to have that much of an improvement. And what, what improved wasn't her strength. Her strength is the same. She didn't get stronger. What I improved is the activity of the nervous system to the muscles around the joint to better support and stabilize the joint. 
So we're going to talk about some of these exercises that you'd want to do to improve range of motion and strengthen the, 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 uh, the ankle joint for landings. But the first thing is we need to assess where our athletes are at. And a very simple test is this knee to wall test. You get your gymnasts with their feet flat against the wall. And while they're keeping their heels down, you'll get them to try to bring their knee to the wall. And if they can touch the wall, great. Move their foot back a little bit. See if they can go to the wall. And if they cannot touch the wall, good. Move it further back. Keep going until you get to a point where their knee is just barely touching or the last spot they touched before they weren't able to touch. And that gives you the range of motion that they have at their ankle. This gives you where they're at. Visually, you can see what they can do at their ankle. And as you're doing these exercises, you can see the improvements. Just to give you, um, I don't know if I included this picture, so I'm gonna show you with my feet. Just to give you some perspective, I'm gonna tip this down so you can see my foot here. Hopefully you can see it. I'm gonna bring my computer over. And make sure you guys can see me. Okay, so typically speaking, if, you, if two people, if they put both feet out in front of the other, and I bent my back uh, ankle, and I brought this knee forward, I should be able to get halfway down my other leg with this knee being bent. Hopefully that shows in that, in the, um, on the computer. So that's another way you can do a really quick assessment to see, okay, how much range of motion does my gymnast have at their ankle? So if you don't have a wall, just have their feet out in front of the other, the back knee uh, ankle starts to bend and see if your back knee can go at least halfway to the front, uh, to the front foot. And that would be an ideal range of motion. Anything less than that, you're risking some potential injury and some potential missed landings because they may not have the range of motion they need to be at. So that's what you wanna to work towards. But this will give you a test to be able to see where they're at to begin with. The only thing I'll make note of is make sure when they're doing this test, their arch isn't collapsing, their foot isn't rotating out, they're staying straight to the wall as they're doing it. It's okay if their arch collapses a little bit. That's a natural thing, but you just don't want it to be collapsing so much that they start to rotate their foot out. So once you got a sense of what they're capable of, then you want to work through strengthening and stretching tissues that may need it. So very easy things that most gymnasts do anyways are things like calf stretches. So I'd encourage that. The other critical thing that isn't worked on as much is the flexibility of the tissues uh, that go towards the toes, specifically the big toe. The big toe tendon is one of the strongest tendons of the body, and it's like that because our big toe actually drives a lot of our propulsion forward. And that also contributes to the tension that may exist in the soles of our foot that could also limit ankle range of motion. So there's your normal stretching of your calves, as you can see, but then there's also an effort to try to stretch the tissues under, underlying uh, your big toe as the other two images show. These are stretches and flexibility related things that would be worthwhile doing and doing enough so that there's improvements within uh, the tissues, the pliability or the, ability, the resiliency within the tissues. But ultimately, if you've heard me speak before, flexibility is not where you want to stop because whatever flexibility you gain isn't going to translate to actually having strength in the, in the uh, joint in those ranges. So implementing some various different strategies, like I talked about a training at the in the webinar I did on training at the edges. So here's one example. So that's me. And what I'm doing is I'm strengthening and improving my range of motion at the same time. And that's the benefit of doing some of these uh, uh, end range isometric exercises that I've introduced to the various gymnasts is I'm not only improving the range of motion, but I'm strengthening uh, my, uh, my joint at the same time. So what I'm doing here is my foot is flat on the ground. I'm pressing my foot into the ground for a certain duration of time. Um, and then at the end of that, my foot stays flat. My foot is staying flat on the ground, but I'm actively trying to lift my toes up as I bring my shin down. So I'm trying to close that angle in the front of my ankle and be able to go a little bit further. I've just put a little bit of a weight, a kettlebell weight on top of my knee to assist me to try to go further. So you can see my heel stays down, but I'm going further and further forward. And I'm using muscular contractions in the front of my ankle to actually do that. 
So I'm not passively doing it like it's done in P PNF stretching. I'm actively trying to do it so, so I strengthen it. So I've strengthened as I go forward and I can repeat this a number of times. So these end range isometric exercises, one way you can improve, not only improve range of motion, but improve strength. But you'd wanna work uh, on top of that. There is uh, a number of different joints. If you look, remember back, there's close to, uh, I think 33 different joints in your foot and ankle area. So there's a lot of different tissues and a lot of different areas that we also need to strengthen. And most gymnasts, um, a lot of gymnasts, develop really good intrinsic foot strength and for some of them, they do it to the point of fatigue. And once fatigue sets in, because they get no rest, they start failure. And what that leads to is loss of intrinsic control, meaning loss of control of all the small muscles in their foot that uh, assists in you know, having excessive pronated feet or inability to, to control the arch or move the foot um, when you go. So these are some exercises that you can do. So, this one exercise on the left, the gymnast will have the inside part of the foot on the beam or some ledge. They can hold on to something for balance and they use their big toe to push up and then slowly come back down. So we're specifically trying to isolate not only all the calf muscles, but the muscles of the big toe to try to push up. Now you may think to yourself, how is this improving range of motion? Well, as we improve control of the muscles of the foot, we can better up, we can put our ankle in a position to better do what it needs to do and improve its range of motion. Sometimes the stiffness could develop at a joint as a result of compensating for other joints that aren't behaving really well uh, or other tissues that aren't behaving really well. And the exercise in the upper right, this time they have the outside part of the foot on a ledge. They're letting their arch drop and then they're lifting their arch right back up like this uh, lady is doing. So they'll be standing on one leg. They can hold on to something for support, let that arch collapse, and then lift that arch back up uh, to strengthen the muscles that helps stabilize and control movement around the specifically the mid portions of the foot. Finally, this bottom exercise, it's, it's an exercise that's typically given to older individuals. And the reason being is the strength or the activity of the muscles in our feet directly affect the activity of the muscles in our thighs. And as we get older, that activity in, uh, in our thighs starts to diminish and actually contributes to a lot of the falls that we get. However, just because there, it was originally designed to give to older people, it doesn't mean that it, it's not going to benefit gymnasts. Because when you land, if you go back, if you remember back to that picture of ideally how gymnasts are taught to land right now, which is a lot of bending at the knees, you need really good activity in those thigh muscles. You need good strength, but you need really good activity. So this one exercise at the bottom right corner, they're standing with their feet flat and they're leaning their whole body forward until they feel their toes dig into the ground. And they're gonna, once they feel that, they're gonna try to hold that position. And they could hold that position from 30 seconds up to a minute um, and to help strengthen those intrinsic, those smaller muscles in the foot uh, to, for improvements in range of motion and stability in the foot, but also to help improve activity in their thigh muscles. Oh, that's a picture of a bike that's not supposed to be there. I'm not sure why my picture has been attached, but nevertheless, that's a nice looking bike. The last thing that's really important if we're talking about how can we improve landings um, is we've, we've looked at what needs to be done at the foot and ankle. Um, but just in terms of overall, not just for the foot and ankle, but overall for the whole body. And that is the implementation of some eccentric controlling exercises. So when I say eccentric, do you guys know what I'm talking about? I'm just going to assume that some of you know, and probably some of you don't know. So when a muscle contracts, there is the portion of activity where the muscle is shortening. So it's shortening. We call that a concentric contraction. Under load, that muscle will also lengthen. Like for example, if I'm doing a bicep curl and I'm lowering the weight, that muscle is still under tension and it's lengthening. We call that an eccentric contraction. It's essentially like the negative portion of a contraction. Well, here's something you may not know. Every step we take, every single time we land onto the ground, 
it is in essence us trying to control a fall. Even our gait, for example, the one step we take after another, each step, we're essentially falling. The behavior of the body is such that we're falling and we need to control that. And how we control that is through lengthening tissues, not contracting tissues to shorten or lengthening tissues. This is important because if that's the case and we want to improve someone's ability to land better and control their landing, we need to give exercises that will be consistent to how the body behaves in that moment. And how it behaves is eccentrically. So if I'm giving someone exercises that's doing calf raises or heel raises, and they're just going up and down, up and down, up and down, that's great. They're going to develop some strength, some stamina on the muscle. But it's not necessarily going to be translatable to how their body is going to be requiring to use those tissues when they're landing. And this is a shortfall, not just in the sport of gymnastics, this is a shortfall amongst athletic training and a lot of dis different disciplines. The lack of understanding of this and lack of implementation of proper eccentric or negative controls um, through exercises. So if that is the case, if we're giving someone calf raises to do, sometimes it's advantageous for us to say, okay, do your calf raises, but I want you to emphasize the descent. So I want you to go down slowly to the count of five on the way down. I don't care if you can't come up. Use your other leg to get you up. You just focus on the descent down. Or if we're giving someone squats to do, maybe every once in a while we tell them, okay, you're gonna do your squats, but we're gonna emphasize the, excuse me, we're gonna emphasize the negative. What that means is same thing. You're gonna squat down slowly to the count of five, pause, and then come up normal speed. This is a missing component of training for, for athletics in general, but it is, is in gymnastics. Gymnastics tends to be very explosive type training. Let's move really fast, and that's important. But part of what allows us to move fast is the elastic recoil that happens from tissues tensing or stretching and then recoiling back together. Well, that stretching portion is, having, is happening under activity, or under contraction. So we need to condition that so they could re recoil really quickly. So implementing some eccentric control type exercises um, is vital. And you can look at a very simple one, very easy one to start off. Any of those exercises I've already shown you, you can implement it there with heel raises or calf raises. Every once in a while, emphasize the slow descent down. Don't worry about how many times, if they can even lift themselves up just the, on the way down. Squats is another easy way you can implement it. And the beauty of eccentric uh, loading is that you can handle more weight. So maybe let's say they're partnering up and one holds a 15 pound dumbbell or a kettlebell and they slowly come down to the count of five, give the weight to their partner, they come up without the weight. Then they take the weight back and they slowly come down, give the weight to their partner, come up with no weight. So they're always handling more weight on the way down and no weight on the way up. So we're not overloading their tissues. And we're loading the tissues in the manner that which they tend to fail or need to be loaded when they're landing. The only thing I'll say about this is that loading tissues in this manner is a lot more challenging on the body and on the joints. So you don't want to do it too much. So at the bottom, I put a guideline that you can follow, which is about one time a week for two or three weeks at a time, and then give it a break for two or three weeks where you don't do it. Or what you could say, okay, this week we're gonna do it um, three times a week with a day of rest in between, and then we're not gonna do it for four weeks. You don't wanna do eccentric control type exercises on a daily basis. It's too much for the tissues, you'll cause injury. So a very safe way is just do it once per week for two or three times, and then you can um, give it a break. I, I think I saw a question come in, so I just wanna get to that. How many sets would you do? Yes, so perfect. This, the, the sets and reps, um, I'm just trying to get out that, okay, there we go. The number of sets that I would do, it varies depending on the exercise and it depends on the athlete. So it's not an easy question to answer, but since um, some guideline is good, I would say I would start with two or three and probably not go more than that. Uh, and so let's say 
in their conditioning routine. They normally do heel raises. They normally do squats. They normally do some hamstring curls. They normally with the ball or something like that. Let's just take those, those three exercises. One time a week for a span of three weeks, I'll give them two or three sets of those three exercises with them emphasizing the negative portion. Failure in tissues almost entirely happens during when the tissues are eccentrically being loaded. Almost entirely the majority of sports related injuries. So another reason why it's vital, forget about the requirement for landing, just in general. So I would do two or, two, two or three sets. I probably wouldn't do any more than that um, because you're safe in that amount. There's some athletes, some age groups, you'll be able to do more, um, but those are one-to-one -one basis, specific cases that we need to discuss and we're not, you know, sort of general guideline would be two to three sets. And it's not something you'll generally want to do 15 or 20 reps up. So um, 10 to 12 reps, I would probably say as, as the maximum number I can do. A couple of things to keep in mind is they, if they've done it with an appropriate amount of load, they will be sore the next day. So if you're planning this, this in your conditioning routine, maybe you want to plan it on a day where the next day can be, is a lighter day in gym, or it's a day they're not doing routines because they'll be sore and stiff and they won't have the same output potential. Maybe if they have a, you know, Saturday and Sunday off from training, it could be Friday because they'll be sore Saturday and Sunday. They can come back Monday ready to go. So that's another thing that's important to, along with improving range of motion at the ankle, improving control and strength and run the muscles in the foot, improving or learning to load the tissues of the body in the manner in which you're working on landing, which is eccentrically, is another critical point. So I want to give an opportunity to open, uh, uh, open the floor, any specific questions. And I hope you guys have lots of questions. I, I always say in courses that I teach to physios, chiros, or gymnastics coaches, it, it questions uh, is, is what allows for clarification and depth of understanding. So I hope you have some questions if you have. If not, I'll say some closing thoughts. Okay, just a reminder, please type any questions into the chat box. Um, we'll leave that open for in the next couple minutes. And if nothing comes through, then we'll just close our session for today. So please get them in right away. Oh, there we go. Did you want me to read it, Mahmoud, or can you see uh, that? I, I figured it out, so I think I'll be good this Perfect. time. Cool, is there good. an issue with too much range of motion in the ankle? I'm sure some athletes of mine do. There is no issue with having too much range of motion if you have the strength in those ranges of motion. So I'll give you an example. I work with uh, one of our national rhythmic gymnasts here locally. She has lots of range of motion, tons of range of motion. And about in the majority of her joints in her body, we, she has the strength to control through those ranges of motion. And by control, I mean she can actively move through them herself. And if she can do that, it's not a problem. So too much range of motion only becomes a problem if you don't have the strength in those ranges of motion. Because if you have the flexibility to get in that range of motion, invariably, you're not gonna land perfectly one time. And you'll be forced into that position. And once you're forced into that position, if you don't have the strength, it means you can't absorb the force as well. And if you can't absorb the force as well through your muscles, well, those forces have to go somewhere. So they go through the joint and cause issues, or there's so much for the tissues, the tissues get injured, or they go somewhere else in the body and have to be absorbed excessively. So too much range is not a problem uh, as long as they have the strength. So if you have a gymnast that has lots of range of motion, great. Work on strengthening that range of motion. You don't have to work on improving it anymore. Um, okay, someone asked a question. There's, there are studies that prove that greater ankle mobility reflects less vertical strength. Um, and you posted this study, which is great. I, I'll, I'll look into that study. The only thing you have to keep in mind with greater ankle, uh, the studies like this, um, that's that come out with a statement like this what we don't know is we don't know the the quality of that range of motion again if you have strength through the entirety of your range of motion you can develop power through the entirety of your range of motion and it won't affect uh, your power your vertical um, strength at all so we what, what, what I don't know from this study or any study that's uh, uh, posited is you, what you don't know is the quality of the, of the person's range of motion. 
I have really good range of motion. My, my improved range of motion only allows for more elastic recoil so that I can have greater output. That's like a physiological reality. So if I have range of motion and I have strength to that range of motion and I can eccentrically go that strength, range of motion, then I can absorb more potential energy that's going to be translated into power and strength. So the only thing I will say to that is a greater ankle mobility can be a detriment to strength only if that range of motion they don't have strength in. I hope that um, made sense when I said that. So I, there's no issue having great range, greater ranges of motion, except if you have the strength. Now, obviously, if someone is going to go through their, like if I'm going to squat down, let's take a rhythmic gymnast for example, or dancer that have lots of ranges of motion. If they get into ranges within that joint, they may have strength in, but they, if they get really deep in that range of motion, I'm not going to generate a lot of power here because I don't, ha I don't have the mechanical leverage. My connective tissue and my muscle tissue is in a position where it can't produce a lot of force. So I'm not going to be able to produce a lot of force. But when an athlete, or in this case, a gymnast is having to jump or having to land and land and jump right away, they're not going right to their end range. So we don't have to worry about that. But strengthening to their end range just allows us that if they do a landing and they're off one time on their landing, maybe they didn't do as much rotations and they're off a little bit, at least we know their body can tolerate it to stay stable so they don't take an extra step and B, so they, they don't risk injury anywhere. So I hope that um, that answered or provided some context with regards to the last question. Any other questions anybody has? Another one just I, yeah, perfect. <laughs> do I have any pictures of what the ideal landing shape would look like? You know what? I could probably look. If you guys bear with me for a moment, I'll have to exit from this. I don't know. You guys may not be able to see it, so I'll have to interject it into the presentation. So give me one second. Do you guys see me opening up the uh, We can see yes a slide no. for eccentric control with the oh. motorcycle. Okay, perfect. So you're not going to be able to see this image. So I have to throw it into that slide. So give me one second while I find it. And then I'll show you. Um, I do have a picture for you guys. I'm not sure why I didn't include it. I probably should have included it. Here we are. Did you guys see a picture up here? Uh, yes, there's a gymnast, a couple of angles in front of her body, bent knees on a floor. Perfect. Okay, so this is what an ideal landing position would be would look like. So you can see the, the lines between the, the, the angle of hip to shoulder and ankle to knee, those lines are parallel. You can see their, 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 their feet are flat, so they're getting good range of motion at their ankle, and their hips are actually active in this position. Whereas if we go back to one of the previous images of a gymnast that, like typically how gymnasts are sort of taught, sorry, you gotta bear with me as I go all the way back to this picture, to this picture, oh, I went too far. When, when, when I found this particular image of a gymnast here to the left in a book of what it looks like for a safe landing, you can see these two, the, in this position, when they're trying to be upright or relatively upright, all the majority of the muscles in the posterior part of their hip and some of them in the lower back are not getting involved to much degree at all. So their demand is being put entirely of the muscles on the, on the front thighs to absorb that landing and on the ankle joint. So if we go back to that image of this here, she actually has her hips involved and your butt, your glute muscles, your back muscles, your hamstring muscles, these, these are called posterior chain muscles because they're on the backside of your body. And there's the primary muscles that deal with gravitational forces. So we want them to be active. So in this case, you can see 
this gymnast is um, utilizing that. So, sorry, I'm gonna get back to the questions if I can. I think there's another one that came in, but I don't know what happened to, oh, there it is. Sorry, oh, there's a question. Um, oh, you were just saying thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, so, oh, that's another one. Do you have an ideal ankle range ratio to minimize injury so we can have a reference for tests? Yeah, so the, 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 um, the range of motion that would be ideal, bare minimum range of motion, is if someone can flex their ankle, their knee gets in line with their toes. Bare minimum. That's, that's not even um, sort of what is ideal. That's the bare minimum. In terms of, sorry guys, in terms of what would be ideal, if we can go back to this picture of me, if you can see my knee, how far ahead of my toe it is. So, if, and let me just show you that one, one way I tested it with you guys is I had you, got some wires here that I gotta get out of the way. So just bear with me, I'm gonna change the angle of this so you can see my feet. Okay, so if I have these two feet in front of one another, so I'm gonna do that here. Let me stand this way so you guys can see. So I have the two feet in front of, if I bend this back knee, uh, the ankle on the knee, if I can get this, my heel is down on this, on this foot. If I can get this knee down to about halfway of my foot, which it is here, these are extra long shoes, so don't disregard that. If I can get to halfway in front of this foot, then that is ideal. So ideally, just think of the various different positions your gymnast will land and at, at the, the, the most amount of range of motion they need and the most range of motion they need with strength is for their knee to be able to go at least half or up to half of the other foot forward. So that would be what would be a good range of motion. So this picture of me here with my knee that far in front of my toes, that would be considered optimal in my eyes. And you can totally have more if you want, but that would be considered optimal. The bare minimum is that their knee can get to their toes. So with all these things, this is why something like this exercise or exer uh, that I put this isometric loading exercise at the end is important is because you don't want just the range. So like one of the gentlemen asked about uh, that one study about loss of strength when there's great range of motion, I'll read the study. And if there's, uh, um, and if there's, if I'm assuming that based on that study though, either strength was depicted based on the greater range they went through um, or it was in a range that they didn't have a lot of strength in to begin with. So with all these strengths, the ranges of motion that we want to gain, we want to make sure they're strong in those ranges. So you want to strengthen through those positions and find ways to be able to load in those positions so they can strengthen in those positions. Okay. So any other questions? Anybody will have? Well, I guess that might be it. Okay, so I'll just say my closing thoughts really quick. Oh, oh one more. Where should the majority <laughs> of the weight be on the foot in landing? Um, so there is no ideal position. Uh, if, if, I mean, when you land, if you can have the um, weight equally distributed in your feet, that's ideal. Obviously, if it's too far forward on the forefoot, like on your toes, it's not ideal. You lose stability. There's too much loading on the knee. If it's too much on the heel, that can cause irritation to the fat pad. That's also caught, creates instability. So it's generally throughout the whole foot. Somewhere in the middle is probably ideal. However, in sports and athletics, you can't, it's hard to coach someone or it, you can't necessarily, I find it difficult to coach someone to tell them how to land. Um, well, you can tell them try and land evenly with your foot, but they're going to land how they're going to land. And a lot of how they land is, is dependent on how well they executed that skill. Um, and we're not, and no gymnast, no athlete can execute something perfectly every single time. So what we want to try to do is create the available room so that if they miss it a little bit, they can recover still and, and land. So if their range of motion isn't great, 
then it gives them a very small window of success of how perfect they have to be on that landing, which means the skill coming before that landing has to be that much more perfect to be able to land in this fine range of mo small range of motion. And that means the skill before this skill has to be that much more perfect. So those are variables that's tough to control because in an athletic setting, you know, a lot of different things happens every single time they do a routine, there's slight variations. So it's harder to control telling someone try to land like this. In fact, you would want to tell them that but whether they do or, or don't, we can't control. So we want to give as much range of motion. So that if they did land awkwardly or off a little bit, they have the ability to, to still control it and manage it. So I hope that answered your questions, that question. And then um, unless another question comes in, so just a couple of final points I want to say. So the emphasis um, with landing, obviously, and we can discuss some of the other things that are going on with other joints if you're interested in, in future webinars or whatever. But as far as the ankle joint goes, it is, it's, it's, it's the primary joint that makes a uh, primary area of body that makes contact with the ground. So if things are not functioning well there, then it doesn't matter how strong you are elsewhere. Um, you, that's becomes your weakest link and it's the very first link that hits the ground. So as far as landings go, ankle range of motion, ankle stability, ankle strength, ankle and foot strength is vital. Um, so I hope um, you, the, the, that sort of connected and then, and then when the efforts should be making sure you have range of motion because you wanna give them the opportunity to go through and have options of ranges of motion that they can go through and then strengthening in those ranges of motion. And on top of what's happening at the ankle, emphasize what the, the smaller muscles in around the foot because they contribute what happens at the ankle. And finally, implement some eccentric type exercises because that is the manner in which the tissues work when you're having to land. No tissue is concentrically or shortening when you're, when you're landing. They're all lengthening. And so they're all lengthening or being loaded eccentrically, I should say. They're all being loaded eccentrically. So we want to train those tissues eccentrically because that's the way they're going to be asked to work when they're landing. Um, okay. So if you guys don't have any other questions, if you have a question that pops up that you want to ask at a later time, I put my email address up there. Feel free to contact me at a, at a later time. If you have questions, um, in, uh, in few, uh, that comes to you later on. And then I, I think I mentioned this in the last webinar that I did. If there, there are gymnastic training videos that I've put together that I've sort of, um, uh, uh, given out to or made available to gymnastics coaches and athletes that talks about some of these things that I've talked about in this presentation and I, where I take the gymnasts through them and, and, uh, and, and progress them and everything. So if you're interested in that, reach out to me. Um, this may be a good time to implement some of these things since your gymnasts are at home and uh, have the time. I wanted to take part in that session as well. Um, like you said, there's email addresses up on the screen there, but if you have any other questions or feedback, please send it to coaching at gmbc.org, and I'd be happy to connect you guys after the date as well. Um, like I said, if you have any feedback regarding our webinars, um, including future content that you want to hear or presenters that you want us to work with, I did have a link for a survey in the information that I sent out to you earlier today. So please take some time and fill that out if you have a, a moment later this afternoon or within the next couple of days. So. Um, thanks again for everybody for joining us. Thank you, Mahmood, for leading our session again today. And we'll see you guys um, for the, the next one that you come in for. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys. Bye.